Hello and welcome back. Today I'm drinking a ginseng uh, matcha green tea. It's nice, got a nice like Christmassy spice vibe going on. We're drinking it out of my Christmas mug because it is in fact nearly Christmas. I this year have been thinking a lot about the Christmas season and Christmas time is a time that we see full of festivities and joy and presents and laughter and happiness. And yes, Christmas is all of these things, but something else about Christmas, particularly the way that here in my little Western community, how we seem to do Christmas, is that there is an element of mystery, of intrigue. That might be what present am I gonna get this year, but this, this mystery goes deeper. This mystery goes back to the very heart and root and meaning of Christmas. And it is centered around one man, one myth, one legend. Because underneath Christmas, underneath the Christmas magic, there is something more mysterious at play. Something, dare I say, more nefarious. Now, I am not here to create conspiracy theories. I am here to find the truth. And I'm here to find the answer to question. One very specific question, in fact. This question, in some ways, lies at the heart of some people's Christmas. Who is Santa? Not just who is Santa, but who is this figure that has infiltrated his way into our little old Christian Christmas traditions? Where did he come from? Is he as good as everybody says he is? Or is he simply just a continual sacralization of Christian traditions, of religious holidays, to make them mainstream and palatable to those who don't want to acknowledge their true meanings and true roots? These are some of the questions that I hope we will be able to answer today. So we start at the end of it all in many ways, but the beginning of our journey with this man here, Santa himself. Who is this man and what has he done to Christmas? For anything, we need to know who our culprit is. We need to know what we know. He is seen as the bringer of gifts. He lives in the North Pole. He circumnavigates the globe once a year, every year, in about 24 hours, on a sleigh with his reindeer. And we know that he wears a red suit. This man, we all know, is but a myth, but a legend. He is modern day mythology. Where did he come from? So we shall begin by tracing back our modern day Santa. He is the feature of Christmas movies, of Christmas songs. And in this past 70 or so years, has been envisioned in mostly the same way as a jolly fat man in a red suit with a white beard who travels round and round, goes down chimneys and delivers presents to all the good children of the world. The first step in finding out where he came from is going back. And it is going back to the people, the person, that everybody seems to think popularized and made this Santa, this Santa. And that is, right here, is the Cola Santa. This is an advertisement from the 1950s of a man around Christmas time drinking a cold beverage that looks distinctly similar. They had the same name, they were both called Santa. It is common belief that this is where we get our picture of this Santa from. This is believed that he was widely popularized and made well known through this advertising campaign. That this is what made him a global international figure. And that is the first lie that we uncover about Santa. Firstly, a lot of people think it was the 50s that this was popularized. No, it was actually the 30s when they were trying to advertise to people that they could drink their cold drink in winter because they wanted to keep their sales up 
all year round. What they did actually to do that was continue to make their drink addictive. But anyway, that is a different, different rant. But Santa already existed at this point. They actually, what they're doing is using a familiar figure to advertise their product. So this is a thing that we see happen all the time. This is why celebrities do brand deals. Using a familiar figure to tell you that this product's a good idea. And they're doing it with Santa. So this has happened, this unspecified cola brand that uses a lot of red in their uh, logo and colouring can't have created Santa as we know it because they're using something that's already known. And that is the first lie we uncover about Santa in this mystery. The Santa, nothing special. It just continues the marketing ploy of this company. He's already global. And where did this globality come from? Santa is quite well entrenched in American media. He sort of developed in the States from drawing on other European traditions. And this development that happened in the States then went back out into the world where he infiltrated all over the place. And this was done through two very significant events that actually bookmark the, the advent, the introduction of this advertisement. That is the world's wars. This is where things start to get interesting. This right here, my friends, what I like to call propaganda Santa. Santa was used, his image, especially around Christmas time, in both world wars, to encourage the people at home to give to Santa to be good. It is a war savings Christmas for everyone. He's used in all sorts of uh, things to advertise the general propaganda about how to behave and what people should be doing and encouraging them to do different things during the war. He is being used as a part of that. He is simply another cog in the propaganda machine, which is not unfamiliar of how he's being used over here. This also helps him spread because he goes out with the American troops into the different war zones and where they share when you're having Christmas, right? They share their Christmas traditions and other people, they liked the idea of Santa and they took him home. They shared him with their family when they went home. So that's a part of how he became a bit more global and a bit more everywhere. It was actually through world wars, not through this guy. This guy did more for making Santa known everywhere than this guy ever did. And Actually, this development goes back because it's familiar to use Santa in a war. It is also goes back to the first time that we see Santa in a little red suit. And this is because when we see Santa in his little red suit, it comes from an artist who had done a lot of drawings for another war. An artist called Nast, Thomas Nast. So this here is Nast's Santa. In this Santa, this is actually the Santa. The red suit is the one used in the propaganda, the one used in the Coca-Cola, the one used in our Christmas parades and everything to this day. This Santa, the Nast Santa, came from a fairy tale. Well, a story that a father wrote for his two kids called A Visit from Saint Nick, or that we might know as the night before Christmas. And this night before Christmas, Santa, was here, it was this man. But this, this did not just come out of nowhere. His pictures of Santa have been developing over the course of his career because he was a political artist. He made comics for newspapers and that sort of thing. And one of the common places that he depicted it, Santa, was in the Civil War on the side of the Republican Republic, I think that's right, making images of that of Santa giving out presents to that side to indicate that they were good, the good guys, the good side. So, so that's what he's trying to indicate. So we actually already have the idea here of Santa giving presents to the good people, to the good children of the world, of, of him being on the good side of the war. So that's what he's there to, it's how he first used him. We start to see snippets of this Santa coming through in those artworks. But it was in the book deal, in the illustration deal. And so this, this Santa, really actually begins to appear in the 1840s. So this is 
over a hundred years, nearly 150 years before we originally think we see this first picture of Santa. This image has been around for a long, long time, but actually not that long in the scheme of history. Very short amount of time in the scheme of history. And it was really, really his pictures of Old Saint Nick for visit from Old Saint Nick that popularized it, which was originally came out in 1822. And this picture, this idea that Clement Bort, Clement Moore, the author, of Visit from St. Nick brought to it was another key piece of Santa lore. And that, my friends, is the reindeer. We get the idea of a flying sleigh a little bit earlier. This first portrayed in 1809 in a book called Knickerbocker's History of New York, where Santa is displayed smoking a pipe and soaring over the rooftops in a sleigh, where he's delivering presents to the good girls and boys of the world and switches to the bad ones. And rods for beatings. In 1821, an anonymous illustrated poem entitled The Children's Friend went even further in shaping the modern Santa Claus and associating him with Christmas. It is often described that this, this swear in this 1821 poem illustration is where we truly get the picture of the modern Claus as we know it, where we really have the first Santa Claus. Some historians think that this all, these all, are a part of creating a gentler image of Christmas. Where this really comes from is New York, and that these New Yorkers were inventing new traditions to create a gentler more family-oriented Christmas. Tradition which had begun to suffer from unpleasant bouts of drunkenness and of mob violence in the days surrounding December 25th. So they're trying to direct it to be a more family-oriented event. But this was not the only thing at play for shifting this, because we have another image here that is feeding into who Santa is, and that is the figure of Father Christmas. We often think Santa and Father Christmas are the same, but they have not always been the same. I don't have an image of Father Christmas here, though, which is very silly of me. That is Father Christmas. So the other way that so the other way that Santa Claus was impacted was through the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution, particularly in England and the Victorian era, were ended up being a shift from community oriented to very, very family oriented. And this family orientation that was shifting in this period meant that instead of Christmas being about hanging out with the adults and like what they could do, it was about, you wanted a way to include the children. So this change combined with the Industrial Revolution, so goods were becoming more commodified and easier to access, allowed for a different sort of gift giving to take place. So Christmas hasn't always been a holiday necessarily focused on the children. This is something that has ebbed and changed over the course of its history. And a key figure in understanding how this has changed has been the figure of Father Christmas and how this figure has slowly merged with Santa Claus and added that air of mythology to him. That hasn't always existed because Santa Claus is drawing on different traditions, but this Father Christmas idea sort of worked its way through. Uh, so Father Christmas, or have similar ones in French with like Papa Noel. Father Christmas is a figure that has been around for a while, who first appeared in Johnson's Christmas in a play called His Mask, which was performed for the Royal Court in 1616. In the play, the character Christmas appears in old-fashioned clothes with a long, thin, white beard, and he is calling himself Old Christmas, or Old Gregory Christmas. He chides the guards for refusing to let him in. He chides the guards for refusing to let him into the party. And Old Christmas chides the guards for refusing to let him into the party, and claims that he is a good Protestant, by any measure. And this is a pointed comment, because at the time, Christmas celebrations were under attack by the Puritans, who did not believe that we should be celebrating Christmas. And so from here we sort of go, where did this name of Santa Claus come from? It's sort of this common myth that it comes from the name Saint Nick, which is true, but it comes through something else. And the thing in particular it comes through is the Dutch. And that is because the Dutch have this 
tradition of Sinterklaas. The name Santa Claus evolved from the Dutch nickname Sinterklaas, which is a shortened version of Saint Nicholas. And so this uh, image, this is from a modern day uh, Sinterklaas parade that still occurs in the Netherlands every year. There are all sorts of things about his uh, mythology that we're not going to get into here because we're just looking at how he relates to Sansa, sort of the more clear overt ways. And so Dutch migrants, when they moved over, they refused to give up their view of Sinterklaas and Saint Nick. Because they refused to give up this part of their tradition, it meant that they had quite strong Christmas tradition that they were carrying with them that wasn't necessarily present in the States at the time due to the impact of Puritanism and uh, the way that influenced, which we will get into the impact of the Puritans in just a moment. And so in December 1773, and again in 1774, a New York newspaper reported that the Dutch in the area gathered to honour the anniversary and celebrate his death in New Amsterdam. St. Nicholas's death is December 6th, so they were meeting earlier on December 6th, and an honorary celebration where this idea of Saint Nick and Sinterklaas was sort of coming in. In 1804, a man called John Petard, who is a member, who was a member of New York's Historical Society, distributed wood cutouts of Saint Nicholas at the Society's annual meeting. The background of the engraving contains images which to us now feel quintessentially Santa Claus-esque with stockings filled with toys and fruit, which seems a bit similar to Nast's picture with the backpack and the stuff of the toys and fruit in it. So that is one key space where we get the name coming from. So the name Santa Claus does come from the name Saint Nicholas, but through another language. The image of Sinterklaas, as shown here, is one that is seems vaguely reminiscent. You've got the long white beard, you've got the red and the white ensemble. This looks reminiscent, right? It's not completely foreign to the picture. In the Protestant Reformation, there were all sorts of things that were tradition within the Catholic Church that were being tipped up and upheaved by the Protestants who were like, we've, we've gone off track, we need to bring something back into line here. Things are going to haywire. And one particular group was the Puritans, a part of the Protestant community that really, really wanted to bring things back just to the pure heart intention. They were very earnest and serious about their beliefs and studies and uh, very firm in them. They persisted for quite a long time as well. And so they were a part of wanting to protest the celebration of Christmas itself in a lot of the ways that it was. So they were the more extreme end of it because the other thing that the Protestant Reformation brought was an upheaval of what's called the veneration of saints. So there wasn't really, there was sort of a rejection, not necessarily holistically of sainthood, but of celebrating and remembering the saints in the way that they were with the practice of praying to the saints and believing that the saints were somehow closer to God than the average person. There are all sorts of reasons for this and it was a huge deal at the time because that was really and still is because this veneration of saints is a really core belief and was a core belief and still is a core belief to the Catholic Church. And so with the veneration of saints being discouraged, so with it, our friend Saint Nick is told you can't really be hanging around anymore. Admittedly, Saint Nicholas was not alive at this point in time when he was told he couldn't be hanging around anymore, but the celebrations and festiv festivities which normally took place on his day were no longer taking place. There are these two separate dates. You have one that happened at the beginning of December and one that happened at the end of December. There's one at the beginning of December was St. Nicholas's Day, and this is a day that was celebrating children at the beginning of September, where presents were given to the kids and they were sort of celebrated. And then Christmas Day was a day of festivities that was more adult-oriented. And so this would be feasting and drinking and adult games and that sort of thing. But with the 
cancellation of the veneration of the saints, they're like, oh, you don't wanna lose this completely because we like giving presents. So they shift the present giving to Christmas, right? So Christmas starts to incorporate that present giving, but the figure of Saint Nicholas comes with the present. The idea of present giving is then passed on to Jesus. And so Jesus Christ is the little baby who gives out all the gifts. However, he is given a scary helper to help give out all of the gifts. And this helper lugs around all the presents and threaten kids and encourages them to behave well. This is because Christ, a baby Jesus, is not seen as big enough to lug around all the presents. But also the idea of threatening children is not one that they really want to associate with Jesus but they're not going to lose completely and they wanted to keep both those ideas because they are originally in the Saint Nicholas tradition on Saint Nick's day. This figure of the Christ-like child Christ going out and giving presents in Germany was called Christkindl and this became anglicized to, to Chris Kringle and so sometimes you hear people talking about Chris Kringle as a figure of Christmas involved in sort of the Christmas mythology. And that's a slightly more secularized, weird version of baby Jesus as the one who gives out the presents. The idea of Father Christmas is actually quite separate to the idea of Saint Nick because they were separate traditions originally, but they sort of get merged a little bit through the figure of Santa because they're both taken from their roots and secularized to become Santa Claus. But before this, before we had Santa, before we had Father Christmas, before we had Kris Kringle, there is another figure. We had Saint Nick. From about 1200 AD, so the 11th century, to 1500 AD or the 14th century, Saint Nicholas was the faithful bringer of presents. And then in around 14th century, you had the Protestant Reformation, which started to upheave and change all of that. But why does it start in 1200 AD? Because Saint Nicholas was long, long, long dead by 1200 AD. This is where we come back to the connection between Saint Nicholas and Syndiclas. Saint Nicholas's fame spread throughout Europe in 1097, when his relics were rescued or taken from Myra and taken to Italy. And this happened in 1087. Over time, tales of his gold and good giving exploits gave rise to a, to a tradition of leaving gifts for children the day before St. Nicholas Day, so the 6th of December. In the ne Netherlands, you began to have special markets that sprung up around this time to sell toys and treats for the children. And Saint Nicholas, or Sinterklaas, impersonators dressed in red bishop's costumes to delight and entertain the crowd. Tradition had it that in his quest to deliver presents, Saint Nicholas or Sinterklaas would enter houses by passing through locked doors coming down chimneys and leave these gifts and would leave these gifts in stockings and shoes. So Santa Claus, even though you're having this rejection of Saint Nicholas and the veneration of saints, his mythology continues because law starts expanding that you get this host of all sorts of weird, interesting creatures, including Krampus or Ruklaus, which is rough Nicholas, and Pelsnickel, which is fairy Nicholas, and there are all sorts of others in this sort of Sinterklaas uh, universe. It originally came from this, and today he still wears that sort of red bishop-esque outfit. And so the idea of Santa Claus or Saint Nick wearing white and red came from this time frame. So it has been around for almost as long as his day and has been celebrated in this way. And it has been the red and the white, which is actually seen in Santa Claus to this day. So that comes right back from the tradition. But instead of us having Santa Claus wearing a bishop's garb, which would pay homage to the Christian roots of the tradition, he is wearing a furry suit, which is a part of this secularization. And so who is Saint Nick? This man that we've been talking about the whole time, 
This is not how he is depicted in his first drawings and sketches and that sort of thing. Saint Nicholas, or also known as Nicholas of Myra, was the unchallenged bringer of gifts and hosts of celebration centered around his feast day in December 6th for a very long time. His other role that he played in this was ensuring that kids the line by saying their prayers and practicing good behavior. So he ensures that kids are staying on the right side instead of the wrong side. And Saint Nick is seen as the protector of many groups in uh, saint traditions. The key one for how he sort of got this role as the bringer of gifts and celebration is that he is the protector of children, infants, orphans, and the poor. So he got this role and became the protector of these groups through some miracles that he worked while he was alive and these sort of stories that are told about him. And so Saint Nick was a fourth century Bishop of Myra, which is in modern day Turkey. And he is involved in a lot of miracles. One particularly relevant story is when he came across a man who was so poor and was so poor that he was on the brink of selling his daughters into slavery. Under the cover of darkness, Saint Nick threw three bags of gold down the chimney. And these three bags of gold were enough, were essentially enough to be dowries for the young woman so that they would be able to get married instead of sold into slavery. And the tale goes that they fell down the chimney and landed in their stockings, which were drying by the fireplace. And so there are all sorts of things about the validity of that story and that sort of thing. What we do know is that that is the story that a lot of this tradition comes from. And it is that story that is why we have stockings by the fireplace. It's why presents are given and why the chimney is seen as one of the more important ways that they come into the house. And this was all done on his feast day traditionally. And that is Saint Nick. He also worked many other miracles. He is recorded in some lists to have been at the Council of Nicaea in 325. So he was a prominent bishop in the sort of fourth century, 300 AD time period. And through him, as he has gone through various forms, throughout history and as he has slowly been further more and more removed from his roots as a bishop in Turkey, it has led us to this man here. Through all of this, I think we find the answer to our question. It's the way that we get from here to here is through slowly, slowly removing Saint Nick from his tradition, from who he actually is. And so I would say Santa Claus is very, very much a secularized version of Saint Nick, but we get more of Santa Claus tradition from Saint Nick than I think anybody really originally realized. The idea that the suit and garb that he's wearing is coming from the idea of a bishop's outfit to start with. I would say his main traditions come from the idea of Saint Nick coming into a house and leaving presents and filling stockings by the fireplace. And so I wouldn't necessarily call it an infiltration. I would say it's more been a long, slow, continual process of secularization where he has been removed further and further from his original story. But this, this distancing has worked mostly in name and has not worked so well in the other practices that he brings. But by removing the name, we remove where he comes from and who he is. The main way that the practice has actually changed is through people trying to add more to what he is doing as opposed to taking away. This is the story of Saint Nick and I will recount us going in the other order from here. From Saint Nicholas, right, he was lived and died in sort of 300, fourth century, in 300 AD. He is then sort of forgotten about a bit. Some people still celebrate him. But when his remains are found in 1087 and returned, he is brought back to life. And we begin the celebration of Saint Nick's Day. Through the tradition of Saint Nick's Day, through the tradition and stories that are told through him, we begin to get this development of Saint Nicholas Day becoming a bigger thing and sort of the market, so Christmas markets that we still get, 
being a thing through the Dutch tradition in particular, which leads us to the development of Sinterklaas. And Sinterklaas was able to persist through time where part of St. Nicholas's Day were not. And that is because we start to get the removal through the Reformation and through the Puritan encouragement of the rejection of Christmas. And because of that, we get a figure who is trying to defend Christmas, Father Christmas or Old Christmas, the here. But we also get a figure of another person bringing the presents, but the present giving still persists. Now there's the idea of the presents giving and stuff. St. Nicholas never truly dies and he sort of lingers in the background and starts to come back into prominence as New Amsterdam is settled by Dutch migrants and you Sinterklaas and St. Nicholas Day is brought to the state and practiced there. And that is where you begin to start seeing the images of Santa Claus that we are much more familiar with today, though none of these are dramatically unfamiliar. And so you start to get these pictures of Santa Claus that show some of the things that we would recognize as being distinctly Santa Claus-esque today. And this has come primarily through this tradition, but also through the moving of Christmas to becoming a day about children. From there, Santa Claus becomes a figure that is associated with joy and happiness and jolliness and festivities, which are things taken from the sort of Father Christmas-esque character of holding that joy and festivities and everything like that. And this is also wrapped up into Santa Claus. And because of that, Santa Claus starts to become used for other means because he is now separated from his tradition. So he can be used for other things. And this is where we start to see him used in Civil War propaganda, World War I and World War II propaganda, and also in modern day capitalistic advertising propaganda. And all of this leads us to Santa Claus, there are things that have remained from Saint Nick. He's a figure that is very much for the kids. He's a figure that gives things to the children. And he's also a figure that's about trying to encourage good behavior versus bad behavior. And while what's been given as a bad gift might have changed from switches and tools to beat a child to uh, coal, it is still that idea of encouraging good behavior that he is there for. And so there are many remnants of Saint Nick and Santa, but the biggest loss that I would say we have faced is who he is and why he actually matters. And so when we celebrate this day, when we celebrate Christmas day, and we talk all about Santa Claus, we should really be doing that on December 6th and talking about Saint Nick, because Saint Nick and Christmas only became combined when we didn't want to recognize December 6th as a day that could even be celebrated. This doesn't mean we need to stop giving presents and throughout all our Christmas traditions, but not all of our Christmas traditions come from the idea of Christmas in the first place. But the thing that has remained consistently throughout time is food. Merry Christmas, everyone. I hope you all go and eat wonderful food for Christmas and have a great time with your family. Remember this day, Christmas Day has always been about the birth of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And while other things have come into that and taken away, you should always keep that at the heart. And it's about celebration and bringing together of people and community in that space to celebrate him. I will see you all next year. If you want to keep up with what we're doing, like and subscribe. I've also left links to the other social media platforms that I'm on down below if you're interested. Thank you all. See you later. Bye.